Welcome to iLecture Online. In order to get a better understanding of vapor pressure, I set up some examples here, some thought examples of how we can kind of get a handle on that and how we can get a, an understanding of that. So let's say we have an enclosed container with some water at the very bottom. Let's say we heat up the water 20 degrees centigrade. Let's say there's a vacuum up here, meaning there's no air, no molecules whatsoever, and we have a, a pressure gauge right there, and the pressure gauge indicates that there's zero pressure, zero millimeters of mercury or zero atmospheres. But what's going to happen is the water molecules, they do have some kinetic energy. They are moving around, and because of the collisions between them, every once in a while, a molecule at the very surface, near the very surface of the water, will have enough energy to jump free from the water and go into this vacuum. And so you end up with a bunch of water molecules in the vacuum area there, which of course, once you have water molecules there, it's no longer vacuum. Uh, and those water molecules will be in a vapor state. And the accumulation of those water molecules in here will indicate a certain amount of pressure because they're bouncing around, they're bouncing up against the wall, they exert a vapor pressure, and that vapor pressure can be measured by our pressure gauge. So initially, when there's, nothing, when there's nothing in there, just a vacuum, you simply have what we call an evaporation rate, a certain rate of evaporation depending upon the temperature. The higher the temperature, the higher the, the kinetic energy of the molecules, the water molecules, the more per unit time molecules will go into the vapor state. So we have what we call a rate of evaporation, which is dependent on the temperature. The higher the temperature, the higher the kinetic energy, the higher the evaporation rate. So here an example, when the temperature goes up to 30 degrees centigrade, the evaporation rate will have increased because the molecules have a greater kinetic energy and a greater number of them will have enough kinetic energy to jump free from the cohesive forces of the water molecules because the hydrogen bonding, the water molecules tend to stick together, but given enough energy, a few of them can jump free. So what happens is, once there's some molecules in the area above the water here, exerting a vapor pressure at 20 degrees centigrade, when we reach what we call equilibrium vapor pressure, the, the pressure of the water molecules that are now in the vapor state, the vapor molecules, will be at 17.5 millimeters of mercury, which is about 2.3% of the atmospheric pressure. Once you start having some molecules up in this container here, they begin to bounce around, and every once in a while a molecule will hit the water surface and recondense, rejoin the molecules that are there, and that is called condensation. So you'll have condensation. As the amount of molecules increases in here, you can see that the rate of condensation will increase as well, and eventually the rate of condensation, which is the number of molecules per unit time that rejoin the water, will equal the number of molecules that will evaporate. At that point, we say they have reached dynamic equilibrium, that the rate of evaporation will have equaled the rate of condensation. At that point, no additional total number of molecules, vapor molecules, will be added to the container, and the vapor pressure will now be constant at the 2.3% of atmospheric pressure, or 17.5 millimeters of mercury. If we now increase the temperature of water, bring it up to 30 degrees, then you can see that the rate of evaporation will increase. That will cause more molecules to go into the container area. You can see that the pressure, the vapor pressure of the water molecules will now have increased to 31.8 millimeters of mercury, which is about 4.2% of atmospheric pressure. And you can see that the rate of condensation will then also increase because you have more molecules up there, more of them bouncing against the water surface and being reincorporated into the water down at the bottom. And again, you'll reach a dynamic equilibrium, but it'll be at a higher rate and it'll be at a higher vapor pressure. Now what we'll see, there's a close connection to this and the amount of water that you can have in the atmosphere. It turns out, as the atmospheric temperature increases, it can hold more water and it can have more what we call vapor pressure. Except in the atmosphere, the vapor pressure will be the partial pressure of the total atmospheric pressure. In the next video, I'll show you a little bit more examples of how that works. But here, it suffices to just simply think about the interbalance between the number of molecules that escape the water through the evaporation process because of the internal kinetic energy of the water and the water's molecules condensing back into the water, the vapor, uh, vapor condensing back into water by hitting the surface and being reattracted by the hydrogen bonding back into the water. So you can see that we have this equilibrium called dynamic equilibrium and the rate at which this happens depends on the temperature. 
If the temperature is greater, it will happen at a greater rate. More molecules per unit time will be evaporating and condensing at the same time. At lower temperatures, fewer molecules will do so. But since there's more molecules being evaporated, it will take a while before sufficient molecules appear in there before the rate can be equalized, and that will then happen at a larger or greater partial pressure or vapor pressure. When we reach a point where we reach dynamic equilibrium, we call the pressure inside the equilibrium vapor pressure. Normally we don't say equilibrium, we just simply say vapor pressure, but that's just to indicate that we've reached the maximum pressure you can have at a particular temperature for the water, and that's called the equilibrium vapor pressure. And that's how you do that.